and CEO. President and CEO of Research America. And I'm so pleased to welcome you to this year's National Health Research Forum. The challenges we face as we all work toward progress in assuring healthier lifespan for all are complex and multifaceted. From emerging infectious diseases to chronic illnesses, the need for groundbreaking research to provide the inspiration for product innovation, more effective prevention, and more effective, accessible, and affordable healthcare delivery has never been more urgent. And the interdependence of medical and health research with the broader science and technology enterprise, also challenged right now, demands our attention. The work that you all do as researchers, scientists, clinicians, patient advocates, and industry professionals is crucial to addressing these challenges and improving the lives of countless individuals around the world. For nearly 30 years now, Research America's National Health Research Forum has provided a unique platform as we talk about uh, as we talk with leaders from across our enterprise and ecosystem about ideas, action, and their own inspiration about what it takes to speed scientific, medical, and public health progress. With our signature straight talk approach, we aim to ex exchange ideas, build partnerships, accelerate progress, and make a lasting impact. We are grateful to our sponsors and partners for supporting our event today and tomorrow. Our thanks to our principal sponsors, Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer. Special thanks to our supporting sponsor partner, Sanofi. And to our collaborating sponsors, the American Association of Medical Colleges, AdvaMed, Amgen, Colgate, Columbia University, Elsevier, Eli Lilly and Company, Novartis, Novo Nordisk, and the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, PCORI. Thank you to our contributor, contributing sponsor, ESI. And thank you to our event sponsors, the American Society for Microbiology, GRAIL, KDCR Partners, Pharma, and Ultragenics. We do have an exciting lineup for you over the next two days. With more than 40 speakers from across the innovation ecosystem, our agenda spans a wide variety of thought-provoking topics and discussion. We look forward to hearing from leaders from major federal health and research agencies, the National Institutes of Health, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the National Science Foundation. And you won't want to miss today's keynote session at 1.15 p.m. Eastern Time, featuring the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, or ASPR, within the Department of Health and Human Services, Ms. Dawn O'Connell. Speakers at this forum will challenge the status quo and explore strategy for out-innovating health threats, and science and technology challenges. Your participation in the forum will help ensure this two-day event inspires new thinking, new partnerships, and urgently needed progress. Our first session features Dr. Suda Parikh, the Chief Executive Officer of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and Research America's Board Chair for an update on the Washington landscape in the dynamic science and health policy environment we face. Sudip will be joined in conversation by my good colleague, Ellie Dahoney, our Senior Vice President of Policy and Advocacy at Research America. Over to you. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, what a privilege to be part of the first program at our Health Research um, Forum this year. And speaking of privilege, um, to be joined by you, Sudip, it's just such a privilege and pleasure. So- well, Thanks, Ellie. And look, being the chair of Research America is an incredible privilege. So it's a, it's privileges all around. <laughs> uh, and, and extraordinary work uh, that's being done. And I'm a little 
I'm a little humbled today doing this uh, discussion on the Washington Update because I know that uh, many of the folks who are involved in Research America are extraordinary advocates who are doing uh, who are doing the work of uh, of taking the message of making research a priority uh, in the United States uh, to the halls of Congress and to the executive branch. So, uh, so it's really a conversation among friends, I think. It, it definitely is. And, you know, I'd like to call it a fun conversation, but I think that that might be stretching it a little <laughs> bit. It's a complex conversation. Um, so maybe we should just jump right in. Um, let's start with appropriations. Uh, yeah, I am so fortunate to be the moderator because then I get to turn it over to you. Um, yeah. so what do you think? What's the what's the current status? Um, what's yeah. a what's a great outcome, and can we get there uh, this year? Yeah, let, let's talk about maybe in two parts. Uh, the first okay. is in the moment, which is that hey, we're in September. Uh, there's a little less than two weeks left in the fiscal year of 2024, which means that. Uh, the federal government has to pass uh, a, either a, a new set of appropriations bills to fund next year or pass what's called a continuing resolution to ensure the government stays open. Um, we know that the bills aren't going to pass, so uh, let's take that off the table. We know that there has to be a continuing resolution. Um, and so the questions that sort of come to mind are, uh, first of all, will they pass one? Uh, will there be a government shutdown? Uh, second, um, how long, if they do pass one, will it last? Uh, and third, uh, will it end up being all year? Uh, and so, Ellie, why don't we talk about that? Because I know you you spend a lot of time thinking about this as well. So we, we should talk about those questions, but then we can talk about the, the broader landscape of appropriations over time, which is what, what I'm truly worried about. Uh, truly, yeah. Truly about. yeah, I was thinking about whether we should kind of end with the nuclear option. <laughs> <laughs> when we <laughs> next year's kind of combustion around all those different factors coming together, but we may may want to talk about that because it, it really goes to appropriations and budget caps. Yeah, yeah, I maybe, maybe we I think we'll pass a CR. Yep. Um, I, well, I don't think we will, but <laughs> I think. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. The, the good news is, is that leadership, all of leadership, you know, that's the, you know, that's the speaker, that's the, uh, that's the minority leader in the House and, and, uh, and the leaders in the Senate, they all want a CR. That there is, yeah. there, we, we don't see any, uh, any challenge. The challenge is in how do you get the votes in the House? Um, and, you know, some of that is playing out right now, uh, which is a good thing. I would rather see votes fail for CRs today. Yes. And next week, then fail on September 30th. Right. Um, and so there's there's you know there's obviously some some votes that are going to happen. They're gonna they're gonna fail uh, today and this week. Uh, and that's by design to sort of let that play out. And so I agree with you, Ellie. I think I think we will get a CR and not have a um, uh, a closure of the government. But you know, uh, it, crystal balls aren't, aren't aren't too clear these days. You know, there's another question that um, bears on R&D, importantly, um, ar that around the CR, and that's whether there'll be any um, so-called anomalies, any additions to the, the CR one that um, I know a lot in the audience are watching carefully is the expiration of the Rare Pediatric Disease Priority Review Voucher Program, which has been around for about 12 years now, um, spurred. 39 um, treatments for 39 rare diseases that affect kids and often take, unfortunately, take kids' lives before they reach adulthood. So um, not to say whether there shouldn't be changes to the programs or not, but we are watching whether there'll be a temporary extension of that program as part of the CR. Yeah. So. Yeah. And these things, sometimes they are, you know, I hate to say this, but sometimes the way CRs are negotiated isn't necessarily uh, uh, on the basis of um, the argument, but rather on the basis of the deal you can get. And so That's if, right. if there are no anomalies, there just are no anomalies. Uh, uh, and that that can be that can be a challenge because it means that there are things that really do need to be in there that don't make it. And they're made uh, and that's part of the deal that's made so that you know bad things don't get stuck on there as well. And it's really hard for those of us on the outside of it to to know exactly where that's going to land. And the best way to influence it is to be as loud as you can about the uh, you know about issues that you want to see on that CR and hope that hope there's enough bipartisan support that it can even be an exception to whatever deal there might be. 
And, you know, tomorrow there's a hearing, which I think is, is good news. Uh, there's a hearing on energy and commerce, uh, a package of bills that does include the Creating Hope Reauthorization Act, which would reauthorize this program. So more to come on that. So sort of now. Oh, Ellie, just one quick thing on that. Oh, sure. uh, even if it doesn't make it on the CR, the fact that people are advocating for yes. it, make you know, you're, you're tilling the soil for December. Uh, which is when we might get to another one of these uh, one of these uh, you know, points in the timeline where another CR ends, uh, and and you want to have already told the soil ahead of time to to get your um, your piece of language or your your bill passed at that time. So it's definitely worth the effort. And a perfect segue. Mm -hmm. So life is good. A CR passes. You know, life is goodish. A CR passes, um, and it is. Um, long-term or short or temporary, first of all? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I hope it's temporary. Um, yeah. I don't want a long-term CR because I think that's bad for, um, for NIH. It's bad for, uh, for FDA. It's bad for every science agency. Um, so, uh, you know, the best guess is to just look at history and see what happens. We tend to do these things until, uh, sometimes to right before Thanksgiving, uh, and then sometimes to right before, um, the new year. Uh, or right before Christmas. Uh, those are good things because they force their forcing functions. They force Congress to act party out of, uh, partly out of self-preservation. They want to get home for the holidays or they want to get home for, uh, for New Year's. Um, that's my, you know, if you had to, if you asked me what's my prediction, that would be my prediction. I've talked to several members of Congress who've said the same thing, uh, that they think it'll be a CR until the, until Christmas and, uh, and that they'll need to work things out sometime between Thanksgiving and Christmas. You know, all that said, that does that does align with history. The problem is history has been a really bad, um, uh, you know, a, a, a bad uh, predictor of current events lately. Uh, we have been in a, a in an extraordinary time period, and we're going to be in an extraordinary time period after the election. Uh, it's going to be. Uh, I hope that historical historical trends hold, but I don't. I don't know that for a fact. Yeah, and I think um, you mentioned earlier the argument versus what actually happens, and. Yeah, you know, the fact is a CR just gives you more time. You could still complete the process anytime in that window, but in reality, it doesn't usually happen until the very the very end of that. So Sudip, you mentioned um, let's say that the end date is Thanksgiving um after the election. So would you say that it, it the chances are better or worse for getting it done this year, depending on the outcome of the election or are the complications just different but hard either way. Can you talk a little bit about what happens after the elections? Yeah, sadly, uh, just to get cut to the chase, I think what you said, the, the, the latter point you made is the one I'm enforcing feeling, which is that it's just a different set of problems depending on the outcomes of the election. You know, sometimes, um, sometimes a, a majority uh, that's going to go to a minority uh, wants to get bills done, and you can imagine why they would want to do that. But then the minority has every reason not to not to help with that. Sometimes a minority that's about to become a majority also wants bills to get done because they want to get it off the off their plate. And it's really hard to change bills in significant ways, even when you become a majority. And so all you're doing is setting yourself up for you know for not meeting expectations. You just won the majority. You're going to change these bills to reflect policy from your party. And then you realize there's really not much change you can make uh, right. uh, to them, and so it's disappointing. And so some of the you know some of the longer serving voices on Capitol Hill remember that, and will say, let's just get the bills done in you know by the end of the year and have a fresh uh, a fresh plate uh, coming in 2025. I hope those voices prevail, uh, but there are there are challenges. The challenges are once elections are over, people have nothing to lose. Um, and so they can, particularly those who've already decided they're not going to vote for appropriations, they can really dig in. Uh, and there's not That's much. A good point. Yeah, and not much moving them. And so, uh, so it's just a different set of complications, regardless of which way the elections go. Uh, my my hope is that there is enough um, uh, enough advocacy and and um, I, I'd say um, I'd say optimism 
uh, about, uh, let's put it this way, optimism about that period of time and pessimism, pessimism about the next year to drive uh, something to happen in 2024. And I know it's a funny way of putting it. Pessimism for 2025 means that folks will want to get work done in 2024, and then they can be optimistic in 2025. You know, you're, yeah. you're always trying to do the thing for this week. And so um, letting that that maybe perhaps the scariness of 2025 uh, make you do some work in 2024 isn't necessarily a bad thing because as we've seen, uh, if you don't like the sentiment right now, just wait a minute and sentiment will change because It'll change. events are events yeah. quickly. And what you're saying, I think it's true. It's pretty much the only silver lining about this conflagration of events in January, the debt ceiling, the tax uh, cut expiration, all those, um, and the kind of interest in caps is what do you also want FY25 hanging over your head? Maybe neither president, whichever president we have, may not want to. They want to start things fresh. And so, um, especially since, you know, you just, you just mentioned two giant 800 pound gorillas, you know, uh, the expiration of tax cuts and, uh, and the debt limit, uh, you know, those are, those are giant, giant policy decisions that have to be made uh, in the uh, in the very first part of next year. And you certainly don't want to be dealing with those at the same time you're dealing with appropriations. Yeah, that's what I that's that would be my gut is that there there may be enough pressure there somehow, though, like you said, we're in a, a we're in an era where pressure doesn't work the same way it did. <laughs> in a lot of ways on Congress, on the administration. And so, um, you know, more to come on that. And I do think we'll loop back at the end, back if we have time, back to the beginning of next year and, and also looking ahead at budget caps. Um, but maybe I'm going to use my cheat sheet here. <laughs> I'm sure you all knew I had a cheat sheet. Um, you know, um, one more kind of, oh dear, I'm about to say adjacent. Forgive me, but one more see, um, uh, FY25 adjacent issue uh, potentially is um, NIH reform, or I know as you like to, to call it, and, and I think it's important, is optimization because NIH is really um, such a major, major accomplishment for our nation. Um, so, it, you know, it's good. It's great. Let's polish the diamond, right? Yeah. Um, what do you think? So set the stage for us. There have been there's been efforts on both the House and the Senate side around NIH reform. So what's what's going on? Yeah, um, you know, <clears throat> there's two ways of looking at it. One is it's been a long time since we've um, reauthorized NIH. It's been uh, almost 20 years, um, and even though it's not required, NIH has a permanent authorization. Um, it can be valuable for uh, for Congress to you know help help make things happen at NIH. You know sometimes even if you have a blanket general authorization, when Congress reinforces something that you want to do a specific legislation, that helps and that's a valuable thing. That's interesting. Um, yeah. And and so you know that's the that's the good way of looking at uh, <laughs> NIH optimization. Um, there's another thing that's happening, which is that you know for the first time in my 25, 26 years here in Washington. Um, the support for NIH has become challenging. Um, the pandemic um, has really uh, has, has hurt NIH in terms of congressional support. Uh, and that is, you know, if you told me in 2019 that we'd have a pandemic and that the, the NIH would do the things that it's done and the scientific enterprise would do the things that it's done and we'd be in a worse place, I wouldn't have believed you. But here we are. Um, and part of what uh, you're seeing, and it's hard not to read it this way, is that uh, is that the House uh, work in particular is looking at it in terms of let's fix NIH. It's broken. It's broken. And you read that in the language that you see. The proposal uh, has lots of big structural changes. Yeah. Um, and that's not to say that structural changes aren't valuable. It's just to say that, gosh, shouldn't we talk about them first? Uh, with the scientific community, with the patient advocacy community, uh, with the folks who know uh, that enterprise best before um, before uh, before proposing legislation. Uh, we're going to see uh, perhaps proposed legislation from the House very, very shortly. Uh, and that's, you know, that's something that we're going to want to look at with incredible um uh, incredible energy and in detail as part of the community so that we can uh, make suggestions back. 
I think passing something is important for a reset for that relationship. I want to go back to where we were in yeah. 2017, 2014, um, in terms of support for NIH. And I think the only way we're going to get there is by some sort of a reset um, uh, with the with members of the House that are feeling this way. Uh, in the Senate, uh, Senator Cassie has been leading the process that is about that, that has been very transparent, uh, and he's really called upon the community to provide. Uh, suggestions to him. Uh, and I think the community ought to be uh, taking him up on that uh, in every way possible. Uh, you know, there are things that I know we're all thinking of that can that can improve on a, on a on an important institution. Let's give those ideas both to the House and to the Senate. Um, but uh, but we need to be careful because, uh, you know, legislation is an incredibly blunt instrument. Uh, and so we need to get to a reset, I think, uh, for NIH and optimization could be that. Uh, but let's make sure that we're part of a very transparent, open process um, that gets uh, that gets what everybody wants, which is for the NIH to continue to be and to be an even better uh, source of hope uh, and technology and treatment uh, to to help uh, to help increase the well-being of everybody. Yeah, I think what you're saying is so important because there's a school of thought. You know, there's there's no right answer. It's just what might be the best path. There's a school of thought. Well if you pay too much attention to this, it'll actually happen. If you don't pay much attention to it, it won't. I don't think we're in that space. And I think you really articulated it well, that um, to get back to a real bipartisan uh, place of championing NIH, probably we're gonna need to see, um, we will see some, some proposals that have legs and it may not be until next year, um, but, but, you know, advocates need to be part of that conversation. So really, yeah. really appreciate that. Um, been some, I've seen a couple of comments and this is where I'm going to be in deep trouble because I always forget the name of this committee, but, uh, Kent Lloyd, a, a friend of Research America, and thank you, Kent, uh, mentioned, Kent mentioned that, um, that HHS has reestablished the SMRB. Scientific thank you. Research thank you. Board. Thank you. Sure. Um, so at least one piece of that puzzle. Um, again, that could cut either way. Mm -hmm. Congress could say too little, too late. What are you, you know, are you kidding? We, we are going to do what we're going to do. Or they can say, well, that at least you listened to us on that to, or you did, you know, so I don't know. What do you think? Uh, I think it was right to, to, to reestablish the SMRB, um, you know, better, better late than ever is, uh, is important. Um, that said, it may not satisfy Congress. I don't know the answer to that. Um, and so uh, it's good to have parallel tracks to success. Um, and I can imagine the SMRB, uh, uh, the reestablished SMRB, uh, doing the work of making a proposal on structures at the NIH that could be valuable. Um, I could also imagine, uh, you know, it informing um, Senator Cassidy's work or the work on the House side, yeah, uh, yeah. even if it's not come to come to completion yet in, in the SMRB. So uh, having parallel uh, tracks to success is never a bad thing. Um, the thing I would, you know, the, the thing I'd really want to uh, be careful of is not to um, uh, not to implicitly um, agree that a wholesale change of NIH is the right answer. Right. Um, right. We want to make sure that that's not the implication by um, uh, by reestablishing this thing. That it could be it could be somewhere in between. And you know, I don't know the answer to that right now. You, know, those of us who are in this conversation, uh, are the ones that together will, I think, come to a consensus answer about what's the right thing. And so, NIH optimization doesn't necessarily mean you know throwing everything out and starting again. Uh, it can mean uh, that there there are pieces that that need to change and need to. Um, uh, modernize, and there are pieces that, thank you very much, have worked very well, uh, and we don't want to change them, and we've got to be a part of that conversation. And I think that's right, and I think the advocacy community, again, there there is a, a school of thought that says NIH should change NIH, and others should not. They don't know, and I think we're advocates who want strong relationships in Congress and who believe in Congress's role just need to recognize that Congress has an accountability and oversight role for the programs it, it authorizes and, and patients and others have a right to weigh in on the way NIH should look. So I think that we are, you know, it's really good if we all think about how do we improve upon this process and make it the best it can be and have that, that attitude. That's just, that's my bias. Um, Susie Sunshine over here. 
it's hard, Ellie, because, you know, those of us who are in the enterprise, we think, who's going to possibly know this complex enterprise as well as us? Yeah, exactly. And, it's and, exactly and, and that is, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a real bias. But you have to remember, you know, I, I'm, I'm fortunate, and I think many of us are fortunate to have connections in, our, in communities that are outside the scientific enterprise. And they remind me often that, you know, they pay taxes and they, uh, they care about scientific research and they care about uh, 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 the research that goes on at the NIH, but they also care about other things. And so they want to ensure that uh, that there is oversight by their elected leaders, and I yep. and, you know, that is that's the way that the system is designed, uh, and we have to work within that system, I think, to get the best possible outcome. And uh, and when I you do it, right. when you get that, then good things happen because then you get the support of Congress in a way that you hadn't had before. Uh, and I would argue that you know the the reforms of two thousand five and two thousand six. Uh, that reauthorization, although there was a period of stagnation until 2012, 2012 and onward wouldn't happen without that re, uh, without that reauthorization. You know, it reminds me as an aside a little bit about the why do you need patients in research and why do you need patients to inform research policy? And then, oh, wait, it turns out it was a patient who said, why are you caring about this and not this? This is what's really affecting our lives. And, and it's patient-centered research has been a real success. So, um, you know, I think, I think it's, it's, it's an interesting kind of a parallel there. Um, and Cortez, I promise we'll get to your question. Thank you for asking it. We'll come, we'll swing back there. Um, so another issue, Sudip, um, the, the, deductibility of um, R and D in the R and D tax base, the 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 tax credit and the ability to um, is it amortize? Um, is that the right amortize? Amortize, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you can yeah. tell I'm a tax expert as well, um, but I do know the R and D tax credit is hugely important, and so there is an effort to reinstate um, a strengthening of that incentive. Any any sense of whether there'll be movement on that this year? It's hard to say. You know, um, I, I haven't detected a, you know, an upswing in, uh, in thought about it in the Congress, and there's so many other tax issues ongoing. Uh, that said, um, it would, you know, I'm a big believer in the fact that the enterprise is connected. You know, we have um, in this country almost $200 billion a year uh, in science being funded by the federal government. We have over $600 billion a year being funded uh, outside of the federal government in industry. We have funding that comes from philanthropy. Um, this ecosystem works at its best when it's working, um, when it's working uh, on all cylinders, all, every one of those sectors. And uh, so when we're strengthening federal R&D in terms of funding, uh, we're also able to, um, uh, to increase the amount of outside funding through the R&D tax credit. We're able to do it in a way that is more, um, more meaningful. If we are listening to um, how, do those, how do we need to implement that R&D tax credit so that it is uh, done well with the modern state of how you invest in technology. And you know, look, I'm no tax expert either, and amortization is beyond me, other than to say that some things last longer than three years and five years. And so uh, sometimes there's a need for uh, for different lengths of time uh, yes. uh, that, for that tax credit to take place. So um, uh, I'm no expert, but I do know that we need to make sure that uh, that modernizing that is just as important as, uh, as modernizing the structures of NIH and, and other agencies. And I do know um, Leader Schumer, when he held, when he was uh, working on the floor with this issue, did leave an opening procedurally for the reconsideration of um, the tax credit package. So we'll see. We'll see. December will be an interesting um, month uh, for sure. Um, so... Um, I want to turn to some issues that are thorny, just no way getting around it, but I, they're so important and they're in the regulatory space and the coverage space. So um, you mentioned that we're, we're an ecosystem that we work together, or as Mary loves to say, or we fall apart. That's and right. it is true that, that every single segment of the R&D ecosystem, public sector funded, private sector funded, philanthropy funded, our academic 
Mm -hmm. folks, our industry researchers, all are very, very important. And that's not to say we're going to agree on everything and everyone's going to agree on everything. But I think to the extent that we can be aware of what's happening in each sector and affecting each sector, and most importantly, in the health space, affecting patients. And by the way, we all are patients. I am one many times over. Um, you know, I think we should try to think that way. And as advocates, um, so a very controversial topic, Inflation Reduction Act um, included provisions. Everyone knows this uh, for price negotiation. I'm, I'm using quotes because not everyone calls it negotiation. It's backed up with an excise tax. So if you don't feel like these, the, if, if industry or patient groups don't feel like a price is, that, that Medicare offering is, is, is appropriate, there can be an excise tax to kind of impose that price. Um, so it's, 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 it's a tricky bill, but it's well-intentioned in terms of trying to get to healthcare affordability. And there are a lot of ways we need to think about healthcare affordability. And it's, so it was that this was the, the impetus behind those provisions. Do you see a situation in which the Inflation Reduction Act is opened up either to address some kind of what many believe are anomalies, like the differential treatment of small molecule drugs and biologics and gene therapy, um, the Orphan Drug Act. Um, and I really think this is an anomaly. I think both are, or yeah. they're, they they actually are not productive in, in, um, in set selectively incentivizing some types of R&D over other side types of R&D. And, and so the disincentive to new indications for orphan drugs. Um, and then on the other side, um, some members of Congress who would like to reduce the timeframes and put more teeth into the IRA in terms of price negotiations. Do you see a situation in which the IRA is opened up, quote unquote, again, I use air quotes, sorry, you guys. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um you know, the short answer is yes. Uh, you know, Congress can go into into bills. And, you know, in the old days, we would pass technicals to fix, you know, mistakes that we made in, in writing a provision. That's really hard to do these days um, in terms of passing uh, technicals. But uh, on these issues that you're talking about, depending on the outcome of the election, uh, somebody's going to open up some part of it. Yeah. Um, and so uh, right. it is important to keep the conversation going about uh, uh, about you know whatever side of these uh, issues you take. Um, what I'd say is that you know you, you, it's once these things pass, they have a way of uh, the ground shifts, uh, whether it's negotiation, uh, whether it's um, uh, some of the some of the incentives for uh, uh, you know the differential treatment of, of small molecules and biologics. The ground shifts uh, over time, and particularly on negotiation. You know, I'd be really careful about that because uh, the ground has shifted a bit to where you know you're not hearing um, uh, you're not hearing a tremendous outcry to say ah uh, you know the uh, a President Trump presidency would change that. Um, yeah. uh, and so I, I I sometimes I sometimes am, uh, I offer the suggestion that you know be careful of what you want to open up. Be careful of the conversation because it could end up that the ground is shifted to where there's actually movement in the direct the exact opposite direction you were thinking of yeah i think that's right and i think either way and i think research has such an important role to play we have got to address healthcare affordability it's not going to get better yeah um and it, it crosses every sector of the healthcare system and um it's something we really need to talk more about and going back to my cheat sheet now. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, just to, to put a put a period on that discussion. You know, the answer can't be that we shouldn't do anything. That because no one's going to take that answer. No one's going to take that answer. Um, we have to make sure that these innovations and these technologies and these treatments can get to uh, can get to all Americans. And that is uh, that's something that I think a lot of us got into this in, uh, into it for the first place. I think that's right. And I think that, again, is a really great segue um, in terms of access and its relationship for the research community. If we ignore access altogether, we're ignoring what medical progress is for. 
And so I think whether there are barriers to access that are financial or other barriers of access, we, you know, it's something for the whole community to think about whether we all weigh in on every issue or not. That is uh, a choice of different organizations, but I think we all need to be aware. My bias is we all need to be aware. And I'd like to talk about that a little bit, Sudip, in terms of the, and I know that we have only five minutes left, I believe. Is that even five minutes left? Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk fast. <laughs> um, I, I do wonder whether what actually Congress and the White House can do about this increasing uh, kind of gray area between FDA and CMS. So FDA approves something under accelerated approval and Medicaid doesn't cover it. They call it experimental or private insurers does. Yep. Um, Alzheimer's medicines are subject to coverage with evidence development, which is basically patients have to be in clinical trials and their other requirements. First drug to be subjected to that, was that for fiscal reasons and is that okay? You know, um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not making a judgment, I'm asking the question. So there are a lot of cases of this, a blur between, and even NIH in some cases doing um, types of research that inform the fiscal question. Um, what do you think might happen just to get some clarity here and factor in what the public wants and what makes sense? Um, yeah. yeah, this is a thorny one, Ellie. Uh, you thorny. know, what I'd say is that what I'd say is that there's sometimes there's a, a value to strategic ambiguity, uh, which is that when you're trying to figure out what is the best process, sometimes having the ability to to not know exactly what it is and to chart that process can be valuable. In this case, we've gotten past the point of that being valuable. Uh, there is a need for clarity uh, and only Congress can step in and do that. And to be honest, it's gotten harder because of the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court has uh, just recently uh, overturned what's called the, the Chevron Doctrine. Huge, uh, huge. Yeah, thing. which means that uh, they can't, Congress can't just be ambiguous about saying, go regulate this. They have to be much more specific. And so that means that in the legislation that has to be written to clarify these roles, it needs to be even more clear than it would have had to have been two years ago. And so as advocates, I think, you know, we have a really important role to play to, first of all, help educate uh, and have conversations with the legislative branch on specific language that would be needed to clarify these roles. And I get that I get the incentives on either side of how to do this. And I, I know that there is tension there. Um, that tension, I would say that it's in everyone's best interest for that tension to be worked out amongst the parties that have that tension before they get to the legislative branch. Yes. If you get there, you're going to get to a point where you're going to have folks who don't have the background and it's going to be a coin toss as to whether or not the right way gets done or not uh, or doesn't get done. So I, you know, my encouragement to everyone is as you even as you have disagreements uh, among in our own community about what the clarifications ought to be. Get together ahead of time uh, because this is going to get murkier and murkier. And uh, the final decider, if Congress writes something ambiguous, is going to be the courts. And I can't think of a worse place to uh, settle this than um, than in the courts. No, and you know, um, it, we've been talking about it at Research America. We need to hold um, a meeting for our alliance members to talk more about the Chevron um, doctrine and and. Sudip, we're probably going to try to co-op some of your time for that. Um, one minute, and then we have to close. Um, I promised, I promised our um, intern that we would, one of our lovely interns, that we would address this question. Why wouldn't we do taxes and appropriations together next year? <laughs> well, that sounds like a really rational thing to do. Um, <laughs> Um, Cortez uh, is that our lovely intern Cortez is rational. <laughs> that, that's incredibly rational, and um, and uh, yeah, you know, there are times that I would I would wish that we could do that. Um, you know, it comes down to practically it comes down to a couple of things. One is jurisdictions in Congress. Uh, different committees have jurisdiction over those two things. Now, look, leaders can overcome that and can put things into giant packages, and they might do so. Um, I, in my opinion, it's we're better off for appropriations to get done and yeah. out of the way uh, by the end of this year, because if it gets included in something like that, then there's horse trading that could happen. Uh, and I don't think it's to the benefit 
of uh, of the science agencies to be a part of that horse trading. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in, in my in my selfish uh, for my selfish reasons, I think that they should be separated. Uh, for practical purposes, Congress is a bunch of turfs. You know, there's chairmen and chairwomen of oh, different yeah. cities, and they want to get their thing done. They want to do it in their way. They want to get as much of their influence into those bills as possible. And when the bigger of a package that gets wrapped up, the more power goes to leadership as opposed to those committee chairs. And, um, you know, they don't like that. No. And um, with that, we're going to have to close. I, You know, you conveniently made this run so that I don't ask you who's going to win the presidency. Um <laughs> <laughs> then we've run out of time. Um, please join us for our next session. And Suda, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, first off. Um, thanks to you and thanks to Research America. And thanks to all of you in this uh, in this conversation for your advocacy. It matters. It matters. Um, join our next discussion, um, Exploring Innovations in Health Systems Research, um, featuring um, Dr. Rar Valdez. If you haven't heard him speak, he is fabulous, as is his moderator. Um, you know, we, we were just going to, we're really looking forward to it. Please join us there. And thank you. Thank you all.